Hello, my name is Jörg Drescher. I will talk to Karl Weidequist, who holds a PhD in political theory and another one in economics. He teaches in Qatar as visiting associate professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Furthermore, he is co-chair of the Basic Income Earth Network and a member of the Coordinating Committee of the US Big Network. One of his topics is basic income and he is very interested in the Alaska Permanent Fund. I'm going to ask him some questions about these issues. Mr. Weidequist, recently you finished a book together with Michael Howard on the Alaska Permanent Fund. Do you think the scheme of the Alaska Permanent Fund could be suitable for other countries too, even those which do not have mineral resources? Yes, I do. That is, in fact, one of the major themes of the book, is that you don't have to be resource rich to have a resource dividend. The Alaska, the Alaska Permanent Fund dividend is like a basic income. It's Alaska's, it's Alaska's version of it. What they do is they tax their oil, and uh, as they export it, they tax it. And the state gets almost all of its revenue from oil, and it puts a tiny amount of that into a fund. And the fund is invested in stocks and bonds and real estate and all kinds of investments all over the world. And out of the returns from that fund, every year, every citizen resident of Alaska gets a dividend. It's usually in the neighborhood of one to $2,000 a year. Um, now, so that's what the fund is, and that's how it works in Alaska. And they found it easy to do that because they were creating the oil industry, and they did it when they started. That made it easy to do politically. But it's actually very easy to do elsewhere, and there are a lot of reasons for it. One, it may not be as easy politically elsewhere, but it's definitely easy economically. Uh, one of the main reasons that you don't have to be resource rich to have a resource dividend is all countries are resource rich. All countries have very valuable resources, even the poorest country, when you take them into, when you take what's actually a, a shared natural resource or common good into account. Uh, the, uh, the atmosphere is a shared resource. People should be paying for any pollution they put in the atmosphere. That will both discourage pollution and create a lot of revenue, a, a great solution to global warming and other pollution problems we're having is make people pay to pollute, make them pay a lot, put that money into a fund like the Alaska Fund, and it'll create a permanent dividend for everybody. But you can also do it with land value. You can do it with, uh, uh, with uh, groundwater that a lot of companies are taking groundwater for free and from out of out of our ground and bottling it and selling it back to us. Um, also, things like money creation, the broadcast spectrum. Most governments give away the broadcast spectrum spectrum to corporations who then sell it back to us um, by advertising or or selling us cell phones or something like that. They get this resource for free and they sell us not only the service of providing the cell phone or providing the television or providing the radio, but also they sell us the value of having a limited amount of the broadcast spectrum, which other people don't have. And because that's limited, it creates a big rent, which we could be selling to them instead of just giving it to them free. Um, so every country and every state can do that. And one of the authors in the book uh, does, in the second of the two volumes, one of the authors does a really great empirical study where he looks at how much could a resource poor state of Vermont uh, take in resource revenue that it could have an Alaska style dividend. And he does various estimates. It's, it's hard to make an estimate of all these things that you could be taxing that you're not because some of them, well, how much would people pay for groundwater that they're taking out and bottling if they had to? And it's uncertain to know exactly how much it would it would fund. But his low estimates um, are in the neighborhood of two thousand dollars a year, and his high estimates are over ten thousand dollars a year. That little little Vermont, not known for its resource exports or anything, Vermont could have a dividend of over ten thousand dollars a year for every man, woman, and child.
One of your former presidents, Thomas Jefferson, said, Information is the currency of democracy. But what about real money, as some adherents of basic income demand to achieve democracy? Would you say economical independence, as it is proposed with basic income, is a must to realize constitutional rights? Well, um, the, uh, that, so Thomas Jefferson said that information is the currency of democracy. That's the quote? Yes. Wow, that's, that sounds so modern. It sounds like an information age quote. It's hard to believe that was said by Thomas Jefferson all those years ago. It sounds like somebody would, something somebody would say in response to all this internet politics that's going on these days. Uh, so, I don't know that there's one thing I could say is the currency of democracy in uh, in, in in these days. Um, uh, but I do think that basic income is an important human right. Um, I argue for this in some of my other writings, not in the books about Alaska. And I argue this because I think that poverty and destitution are the biggest threats to freedom that aren't treated in most modern countries today, is that no one has the right to come between you and the resources that you need to survive. Um, no one has a right to say, you, we've got these resources and you can't touch them to make your own living unless you provide services to us. But that's exactly what most countries in the world do. All benefits are conditional on working for someone else other than just for yourself. Uh, and our ancestors did not do that. For, for hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors were hunter-gatherers, and even the first farmers did the same thing. If the hunter-gatherers and the early subsistence farmers had a big wilderness out there, and everyone was allowed to hunt and gather. You didn't have to ask anybody's permission to go out and hunt and gather. You uh, could camp with a group of people if you wanted, but none of them could stop you from going out and hunting. None of them also could stop you from breaking off from the group and doing things your own way if you wanted to. Uh, and so this idea, and, and you, in those kind of societies, they're not, they're not wealthy, they don't have the technology that we have, of course, but they don't have the kind of desperate poverty and destitution that we have in the modern world today. The modern world has actually made a lot of people poorer than our ancestors were tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, and this, I think, needs to be a basic human right. It's not possible in the world that we have to create conditions where everyone can go for it for themselves or even where everyone could farm for themselves. Uh, and so the thing that we can do in replace of that is, is to have a basic income. So there's enough money that you can get your basic needs met by buying them with cash. That's one of the most important things that I think basic income needs to do. And it needs to do that in advance of your entering into the social system. If you have this guarantee that you're not you're not going to starve, you're not going to lack for your basic needs, then you enter cooperation to get better off. You enter that cooperation as a confident and free person. And this is something that I think we need to embrace as a human right, that we won't take that away from people. We, the real thing that's going to make basic income strong is if people believe in that, that I cannot come between my brother and the resources he needs to survive. Now, that's it. So that being, and I think it's crucial to you being a free person in politics as well as in economics. You want to enter these systems you, as a free person, you've got to enter them without being desperate for your needs as so many struggling poor around the world are. But, that, but when we have that, whether it needs to be enshrined in the Constitution or simply done by legislation is not so important. What really protects it is people's belief that that is part of what you need to be free. If people believe that, if enough people believe that, it is protected whether it's in a constitution or not. Let's return to Alaska. 
Are there any effects of the dividend on the kind of Alaska's democracy? And what about inequality in Alaska? Even if the dividend is not enough for a living, does it influence the situation with poverty? It very much influences the situation with poverty, uh, the poverty situation in Alaska. The, uh, there's very good evidence for that. Alaska is only the 10th wealthiest state, but it has the lowest poverty rate. And it is the most economically equal of all 50 states in the United States. And it is the only state where economic equality has been, has been increasing. That means the state has been getting more equal. All the other 49 states in the U.S. have been getting more unequal over the last two or three decades. And Alaska has been getting more equal. Um, and has this low poverty rate. And both of those are partially attributable to the, to the uh, basic income that exists in Alaska. The, they call it the permanent fund dividend. Uh, and it's, it's not hard to see that if you take the permanent fund dividend away from people who are making $10,000 a year or $15,000 a year, you're taking a, a dividend which is usually $1,500 for each person, and that could be $6,000 for a family, that's a big chunk of income for a lot of families, for the poor families in Alaska. And that makes a real difference. No, it's not enough to live on, but it is enough to make a big difference. I see. And which influence does it have to democracy? Is there something different? Well, um, that there's not such clear data on. Uh, the, you can get clear economic data on how it, something like this chunk of money affects economic inequality and poverty. You can't get perfect data on that, but you can get some, you get some very good data on that. But how it affects democracy is much harder to research. Um, I, you do get a sense. I've been to Alaska, and while I was there, you know, I was there to study the permanent fund dividend. So I'm around asking people, uh, what do you think of the permanent fund dividend? Uh, and they think of that as something they own. And the permanent fund dividend is financed by the Alaska Permanent Fund, which has been this growing fund from oil revenue that's been accumulating since the 1970s and getting bigger and bigger. Even though they're paying the dividends, it gets bigger every year because the dividends that they pay out are on average smaller than what they're making. So it's getting bigger and they're depositing new oil revenues in it. It's getting bigger and the people feel more like they own that than other things. Even though the schools are for the people, the roads are for the people, uh, so many things that the state owns are for the people. But this goes so directly to all the people that they feel like they own it. Um, now, whether that makes them get more engaged with other politics or not, I don't know. Uh, it certainly can. If it, uh, having a basic income to free up your time, it can increase your interest in politics. It can, but I can't point you into any in, into any evidence that shows that that is happening. Oh, we, we know it's a possibility, but it's very hard to find out if it's really going on. We are living in a time with huge problems in the financial system. Some countries, as the USA or some of the European community, are on the brink of default. Could basic income help to improve the situation or would such a scheme tighten the problems because where to take the necessary money? Yeah, well, the, uh, uh, the debt, I think the debt problem is, is really overblown. Um, the it's it's overblown if you handle it right um debts are a problem if uh if you have foreign debt that you can't pay uh, then that can be a very big problem for your economy uh but places like the eu and the united states do not have foreign debt. and what i mean what i mean by foreign debt is debt denominated in a foreign currency it doesn't matter so much who you owe the money to but it is what currency is it denominated in? Um, because if it's in your own currency, your government controls the currency, they create the money with which to pay the debt. The danger of that, of course, if you create too much money, 
then you will create inflation. Now, if it's denominated in a foreign currency, then you don't have all those options. You can't just print the money. You can, you can create money, but you have to exchange it into, into the foreign currency in order to pay the debt back. And that's what got so many South American countries in trouble with debt. And that's what got Germany in trouble with debt during the Weimar period. Um, they had they owed money in British pounds and they couldn't just print that and they're trying to print their way out of it. They called it caused hyperinflation. But when you have as European countries do and the United States does debt denominated in your own currency and you control that currency, you can do what lately they're calling it quantitative easing. You can create a lot of words for it. You can buy up your own debt that you you created with money out of thin air. Now that, and you can also you can also finance a basic income with money you create out of thin air. The danger, of course, is inflation. But we know how to keep inflation from getting excessive. We're much better at this than we used to be. You, uh, the the key to the, the the key to understanding how to work inflation is that. Uh, it, the key to, to understanding how to work inflation in an environment like we're in now is that we're in a deflationary environment. Uh, with the worldwide recession going on, the U.S. has actually, during a few years since the 2008 financial crisis, has actually, fall, has actually experienced falling prices rather than rising prices. And falling prices, on average, are very bad because, because firms owe money in that is, at firms and individuals owe money that's denominated in nominal dollars. So if their incomes are going down, but their debt is fixed in dollars, they risk bankruptcy. And that's one of the things that causes so many bankruptcies in a recession, is prices are going down, they're selling less, but they still gotta pay their debts off in, this, in the old currency. But when, so when you're in a deflationary environment, you're free to print some more money and get some more money in circulation, which can get businesses going and uh, can it can make the recession less worse off. And when inflation starts to creep up, that's when you know you've got to do something about it. You must be ready then to tax that money back when, if and when inflation starts to creep up. Uh, if you don't do that, then you can have a lot of inflation later on. Uh, so you need, if you've got a government that's careful with the strategies of injecting money in the economy when it's needed and taking the money out of the economy when inflation starts to show up, it can manage its debt much better. And a little bit of inflation would not be such a, such a bad thing in Europe and the United States right now. I think we're getting a little bit paranoid about inflation when we should, our first concern to be unemployment, inflation, only to the extent, inflation is only the extent, it's important, it, it, it's only important to the extent that it affects real things. Inflation is just how we denominate things. It's purely a, what we call a nominal value. It's, it's just, uh, it's just if, but if it affects some, a real value like unemployment, like the level of growth, then inflation can get to be a problem. But it usually doesn't at moderate levels. If you've got five, even 10% inflation, it usually doesn't have many real effects, negative effects on the economy. And a little bit of inflation would lower the debt burden because our debts are denominated in our own currency. If their own currency goes down, uh, then the value of our debt goes along with it, down along with it, and it is it will lower the government's debt, and will also lower household debt. And we got a big problem now with people owing money that they can't pay. A little inflation would ease that burden on everybody and get the economy going. People, well, I'm not, a lot of people are afraid to do this because they have a misconception about inflation. That they think inflation is prices going up, it's things getting more expensive relative to my salary. That's not inflation. Your salary is a price. Inflation is all, is all prices going up together. When you have inflation, your wages, your salary goes up. So it doesn't really hurt you. Your, your, the prices go up, your salary goes up. 
um, it's it's a mistake to think that everything's gotten more expensive. Uh, you just got a raise that only keeps pace with inflation, um, but you get that raise. And there's very good evidence that people's wages do keep pace with inflation. Inflation does not cause people's wages to go down. Uh, now, in but in, you know, we don't have to have inflation. Inflation is it would have injecting money would have one good effect right now. Even if it doesn't cause inflation, it could get the economy moving a bit more than it is. But even if it does cause inflation, I'm saying we we're we don't need to worry about it as much as central banks are now today, especially in Europe with this debt crisis that's largely in their own heads because they're they have created centralized the power of creating money, but they have not centralized the power of spending the money. The spending the money is still done at the state level, and they need to be spending money at the European level uh, so they can inject some money into the economy. And a very good way to do it would be with a basic income, uh, even a temporary basic income, if they just mailed every citizen in the EU a check. Uh, just mail everybody check and say, here, go out and spend this um, or pay your debts off with it or something, that could have a big kickstart for a lot of the economy. Or they could use that money to buy up some of the success debt. Say, we'll buy a certain amount of debt from every country. You know, if they want to be fair about it, they don't want to take only the debt from the poorer countries. They could pretty much wipe out the debts of some of the countries that own less and then take a big chunk of the debt that uh, the countries that own more own, um, that could go a long way to solving this crisis and they, and they could do it with, with money that they just create. Some opponents recommend to throw the idea of basic income in the dustbin of history. Is it worth to think further and more concretely about this idea? The most difficult problem seems to get from the system now to basic income. How could steps look like? to implement such a scheme somewhere in the world? Well, you know, opponents of anything always want to see it in the dustbin of history, and proponents of anything always want to see it as the next big thing. Um, I work I work mostly on the end of, of arguing for basic income on the philosophical level and showing that works on the economic level. Understanding the politics of how it gets passed um, is not my my main area of expertise. There are I can tell you what I think about it, but I can also point you to people who uh, who know more about it, who study this a lot more. Uh, Yannick van der Borth is written a lot on on that, and Richard Caputo in the United States uh, has is just editing a book about basic income around the world and about the. Uh, about the politics of it around the world. He's a good person to talk to. Also, Carol Pateman and uh, Matthew Murray are also doing a book on a similar topic. They're good to ask about the politics. Guy Standing also works, works on the politics. But what I think is that the idea is increasingly getting out there. People are seeing it as a realistic alternative. It's well thought out. It's on the shelf. If if we need something, that's an option. As long as it maintains as a realistic option, I think someone will want to try it sooner or later. And it crops up in strange times and strange places. Most people in Alaska did not realize that they were creating a basic income when they created it. They weren't connecting what they were doing with the big discussion of guaranteed income that had gone on in the United States about 10 years earlier. Most people did not make the connection that actually what we were talking about at the federal level at that time was what they were actually doing at the state level um, when they created the permanent fund. A few of them did. I'm sure a few knew that. I'm sure Jay Hammond, the governor who pushed it through, he knew. He knew exactly what he was doing, and that was part of what he wanted to do. Uh, now, uh, so it's cropped up there. Um, it's been there's been a powerful grassroots movement for it in South Africa and in Namibia. The government has been resisting it in those countries, but a lot of people are for it, and I think that's a chance it'll happen someday. Um, there's a movement for it in Brazil, um, and it's 
it's now there's suddenly there's increasing interest in it in Germany and other German speaking countries. Um, it was it was being talked about in Ireland for a while, and now it's not, but now it's on in Germany. So the idea keeps cropping up, and the, it's cropped up lately in the strangest place. The last place I would have expected is Iran. Iran has introduced a basic income. It's up and running, um, and it's uh, it's actually closer to the normal basic income model than the Alaska version is. And it happened in Iran as a political compromise. No one was really intending to create a basic income. They seem to have little or no knowledge of the big international discussion around basic income, but they had this huge inefficient subsidy system. They had this system where uh, they were subsidizing gasoline consumption, diesel consumption, heating oil consumption, and several other commodities with these hugely inefficient subsidies that reduced the price of diesel fuel to, I think, something like two cents per liter for a, for a, for a liter of diesel fuel, and you're paying like two cents. Um, and uh, for regular unleaded gasoline, it was like five cents, just ridiculously low. Um, and it was so costly to the government that all the money that they've gained from exporting oil over the last 20 or 30 years has gone to these subsidies. So the only benefit that Iranians have gotten from all the oil they've exported is the consumption of really cheap oil at home. Can't imagine a dumber use of your, of your oil revenue. But it was doing good for people because people got free, almost free gasoline consumption and almost everybody used it and it benefited everybody. And so they couldn't just take it away from them and give them nothing. And so they were negotiating for years and years. They're going around, OK, we got to we got to get rid of these subsidies and we got to replace it with something else that benefits people on a broad, as broad a level as gasoline subsidies did. And they talked and they talked. And, they, and finally, what they came up with was basic income. They reinvented basic income as a compromise to make it so everyone would benefit. And there's. It's a RAN, so there's problems with it. Like they don't give the money to every single individual; they give it to the head of the household. They call the they designate the man as the head of the household, and he gets the money for everybody. So there's problems with it, but the poorest families who are citizens of Iran are benefiting, and the richest families are getting it too. And it's coming out every two months. People are getting it, and they're in. It's very small now, but they're supposedly increasing it over the time where it could be, um, I think it's forecast to become something like $1,000 per person, which is less, it's actually less than the Alaska Permanent Fund. But when you look at the difference in prices, how expensive it is to buy things in Iran versus Alaska, which is the, the most expensive state in the United States, it's actually, it is actually much it is actually, it will go much farther. It'll be, um, it will go much farther towards meeting people's basic needs in Iran. So it is actually much closer to the basic income platform. So it comes up there in this, what is really otherwise not a very sympathetic government, but, um, but comes up as a compromise and something that, that really is doing some good for the, the neediest Iranians. Unfortunately, it doesn't do anything for non-citizens. Uh, there are a lot of refugees living in Iran from uh, from Afghanistan and from Iraq, and none of them are benefiting from this. That's that's unfortunate, but um, but at least all the citizens down to the poorest level are benefiting from this. And uh, Mongolia is talking about introducing the uh, Alaska model. Um, it might happen there. So it keeps coming up, and it you need several things. You need you need a model to be in place. And that's why Alaska is so important. That's why I've edited these two books about Alaska, because people need to see that Alaska is a model that works and it's something we can imitate and adapt for use elsewhere. So you got a working model. People, people who support basic income didn't used to be able to say, look, here it's been tried, but now they can point to Alaska and soon they'll be able to point to Iran Hopefully, hopefully it'll work well in Iran. Um, 
and uh, and say, look, it's working there. You get more working models. That helps. Um, if you get, if you get, you can either have a people's movement or you can have a movement. Sometimes a movement just among politicians will do it. Uh, in Alaska, there wasn't really a movement for it. They elected a governor who made it his top priority. It was the right man in the right place at the right time. Um, that can do it if they're in the if they've got a powerful enough office. Um, or you can have a groundswell of people if the groundswell of the people are strong enough. Even if the government is reluctant, they can they can get it through. So you need some of those things in place. And uh, and I think that the movement for basic income is. They're doing the right sorts of things, and they need to keep up. They need to keep up. There's experiments going on in India right now on basic income, and there's been a pilot project in Namibia. Um, all this increasing evidence showing that it works. Um, there's more and more things that people can point to. Also, cash benefits are being used around the world more and more. In, in, many, in many developing countries, they're finding that if they replace some of their in-kind benefits with straight ahead cash benefits, that it's much better for people. Um, these benefits are conditional. It's going on. Mexico is doing it. Brazil is doing it. Many, many other countries are doing it, moving towards just simplified cash benefit. That's not creating a basic income, but it's moving toward a basic income. And one thing that people have been finding as they look at these, that these have the, the more effect they have on poverty is the higher the benefits and the fewer the conditions. That is, the more and more it is like a basic income, the better it is at reducing poverty in the third world. So we're gaining this kind of evidence. And a lot of countries, though they haven't adopted basic income, then have moved toward it. And I think that's a trend that is going to continue, especially in the developing world. So it might be the developing world that leads on this. Great. Very interesting what you were talking about. Thanks a lot for this interview. Oh, you're welcome.